Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I am Leanne Wheeler, and I will be facilitating this presentation for the next 90 minutes. This presentation is entitled, It's Time to Spend Your American Rescue Plan Homeless Children and Youth Funds. This presentation is being recorded. The PowerPoint presentation is already uploaded and posted on the HETAC website. And hopefully we will be able to answer all of your questions through the chat, which I see everybody knows how to do because they're already putting their names and their wonderful questions in the website or on the chat box. And thank you for being here. So like I said, I am Leanne Wheeler, and I'd like to start off by first saying thank you to our wonderful Homeless Education Technical Assistance Centers. Those are our HETACs. With me today behind the scenes is Denise and Alejandra and Dana from Contra Costa County Office of Ed. And they are manning the slides, they're manning the um, chat box. They have put this whole thing together and I really appreciate it. We also have Jennifer from the Los Angeles County Office HETAC. And we also have Susie Terry and Christina from the San Diego County Office of Education HETAC. So first and foremost, thank you HETACs for always having, um, our, always supporting us. Secondly, I'd like to thank my wonderful Homeless Education California Department of Education team. I'm not sure how many of us are actually on the webinar. Um, we'll start from William McGee, who is our division director, Deborah Avalos, who is our administrator, Mike, my consultant colleagues, starting with Carmina Barrales, um, Heidi Brahms, Jacqueline Matrenga, and Sarah Jean Zocklin. My fiscal team, Elena Fong, Jennifer Tao, and Cindy Rodriguez. Thank you so much for always being supportive and helping me on this fiscal end of it. And last but not least, I'd like to just really quickly introduce, and I'll reintroduce them, but from our panels, we have um, Okay, I'm gonna start. Martha and Marissa from Hacienda La Puente, Kathy Nye from Ventura County Office of Ed, Margaret Lewis and Karen Thomas from El Dorado County Office of Ed, and last but not least, Hannah Anderson. So you can go to the next slide, Denise. The biggest piece of what I want you to get out of this presentation today, there are three big pieces. One, I want you to learn about the resources that are available to local educational agencies around the ARP HCY funding. I want you to hear from your field colleagues of how they have spent their money and what they are doing. And last but not least, I want you to know that the California Department of Education is here to support and help you spend these money, this money. These are just a few reminders of the acronyms that we will be using throughout the 90 minutes today, California Department of Education, County Office of Education, Education for Homeless Children and Youth. All of these more than likely you have already are familiar with. Next slide. A quick overview of ARP HCY funds. So, ARP HCY funds was divvied up into two separate ways. California received $98 million. ARP HCY 1 funds went to our LEAs that currently receive EHCY grants. ARP 2 funds were given out based on a formula. All of these funny funds, <laughs> funny, Sorry, all of these funds can go back to March 13, 2020, when we declared 
having a national, national emergency due to COVID. These funds have to be obligated and expended by September 30th, 2024. There is talk that the California Department of Education will be able to have another year to be able to ensure that these funds have been expended and obligated. Right now, they're looking at January 31st, 2025. Next slide. If you are one of the 120 LEAs that receive EHCY grant funds, your funding results can be found on that website. We did a per pupil allocation and these funds went out faster and earlier than the ARP2 funds. So EHCY ARP1 funds are pretty much in their third year, whereas ARP2 funds, you're just now starting your second year. Next slide. This is why we decided to have a webinar. If you will look for just ARP1 funds, we have only spent 51% of those $18 million. ARP2 funds looks even scarier than that. So next slide. And the, the next slide will actually show, but I wanna let you know where you can find your ARP2 funding results, how much money your LEA has received, was eligible for, how much you've received, how much you spent. That is all in that website. And if you need assistance, you will get my email at the end of the presentation where you can directly email me and I will get that information to you. The next slide, slide number seven, is the scary one. And this is why we really need to make sure that we're paying attention and we're trying to spend these funds. California received over $55 million in ARP2 funds. And to date, based on the summer 2023 quarterly report, only 23% of those funds have been spent. So that means we have over 75% of funds that need to be spent or obligated by a year from now. So my biggest ask today is the next slide. Can you please spend, spend, and spend some more? It's really important that you look at these funds very differently then you look at either your EHCY funds, you look at your Title I funds, you look at your general funds. These funds have a lot less restriction than all of those that I have just um, indicated. They have less restrictions. And so it's really important that not only the homeless liaison is listening, your fiscal people are listening, your higher ups are listening. Hopefully your superintendent or your director of finance is listening. This is a really important piece that we want to spend these funds. Next slide. Here's what it's looked like. I've been in this role as this, one of the state coordinators for over 22 years. When I started back in 2001, California received about $4 million in education for homeless children and youth funds, and we had about 24 grants. We currently have 121 grants, and we're looking at less than 10% of all our LEAs are receiving some sort of supplemental funds prior to ARP funds. And in 21-22, when California California, before California enrolled 224,000 homeless children and youth, and we received $12.9 million. That's only $57 per kid, per homeless student. That's not a lot. So now we've been given $98 million. And I understand we are all saturated with funding, with ESSER funds, CARES fund 
we want to spend these funds, even if we have to spend backpack school supplies and then hold on to them until 24, 25. Hygiene kits. Oh, I'm getting in way ahead of myself. I'm just teasing. Um, it is an important piece also with data. In 22-23, our homeless enrollment increased by over 15,000 homeless children, whereas our statewide enrollment has been declining, and it declined nearly 40,000 kids. So what does that say? We're getting, we're finding these kids. They need services. They need support. And we're going to probably see more kids as our interest rates go up, our rent goes up. All of these things, we're more than likely going to see more homeless children, youth, and their families. So please consider what you're going to hear for the next hour and think about how these, the, the field, and the resources that we are going to provide to you, how can that look like? What can that look like in your LEA? Next slide. So a few reminders as it re reaches, as we talk about ARP, HCY funds, these funds are to be used to facilitate identification, enrollment, retention, and educational success of homeless children and youth from zero all the way through to 21. You have to collaborate and coordinate. The biggest piece when it comes to this law and these kids is a homeless liaison cannot do it by themselves. A lot of time a homeless liaison has two and three and four hats. They're the state and federal program person. They're the foster youth liaison. They're the homeless youth liaison. They might be doing something with CWA. So you need to collaborate and coordinate with them. Transportation does, special ed does, after school program does, community agencies have to coordinate and collaborate. These funds are here to supplement the other funding sources. And remember that these homeless students have the right to any and all services and support that a non-homeless student receives. Next slide. I wanna bring up a couple of letters, one, September 12th, the United States Department of Education released an updated Dear Colleague letter to help to strengthen the use of ARP HCY funds. It was a plea to ask LEAs and SEAs to remove any barrier that we have to make sure that we spend these funds. You can actually download the letter at that link, and I'm going to go into a few of the highlights on the next slide. The letter encourages LEAs to consider modifying administrative processes, including related to budget and procurement. I know I hate that word. I cannot say it, plus I don't like what it does, to expedite the deployment of these funds. You have to remove barriers provide additional clarification about allowable and strategic uses. And that's what we're doing here. These funds can actually be used for short-term short housing. They've even expand, expend, extended the three to five days and on a case-by-case -case situation. These funds can be used for transportation, wraparound services. Also, a big one, the more people that know about the education for homeless children and youth provisions, the easier the job is for a liaison, for a teacher, for an administrator, for a bus driver, anybody is as many people 
inside your LEA and outside your LEA that knows about homeless education and what it means to be homeless makes it easier to identify them, enroll them, serve and support them. Next slide. The, uh, the letter also addresses specific areas and provides strategies, such as looking at improved attendance and reduced chronic absenteeism, address the physical and mental health needs of your homeless children and youth, strengthen early, head, early childhood education, career and college readiness, smooth transition to higher education. We want to put ourselves out of a job. We want to end homelessness. And so how we do that is make sure that they are ready when they start school with all of the necessary educational means, as well as their physical and emotional needs are met. And then we wanna take them all the way through to their career in college so that eventually they can end homelessness and put us all out of a job. Next slide. The letter ends by saying, and reminds us of the critical need to invest these resources now to support especially vulnerable students and young people and urge them to examine whether adjustments to local policies and procedures might allow ARP HCY funds to have further impact. Now, many LEAs and SEAs have asked the United States Department of Education to extend that's September 30th, 2024 deadline. For whatever reason, they are not able to do so. And it's our, it's our time to look at how much money we still have left to spend and spend that before next year at this time. I'm gonna stop there for one second to ask if there are questions that I haven't addressed already. So Denise or Alejandra, um, are there any burning questions that I can quickly go through um, before we meet our field colleagues again? We had a few questions in the chat about um, certain allowable expenses. Do you wanna do those now or wait till the end? Um, I think we can wait until the end. The last 10 slides of this PowerPoint really go into the allowable uses of funds. Um, and it is also posted on our website. So I think we can wait on that. Are there other questions besides allowable uses of funds? Uh, we just had one question, uh, just to clarify if the deadline was extended for the ARP ESSER, but not the ARP HCY. At this point, we have to spend these funds by September 30th, 2024, one year from Saturday. So again, this um, presentation is being recorded. The PowerPoint is posted on the HETAC website. And I'm going to go through one more slide before we jump into our field colleagues, which I think is one of the most important pieces of today's presentation. I also wanted to remind you, and this was just something I sent out through our listserv as well, is in September, on September 6, um, Secretary Cardona sent out a letter regarding immigrant students. And California is affected by um, immigration, refugee, and asylum students, children. And a lot of those families and students come to us in a homeless situation. And so um, the secretary was asking that for LEAs to remember that they can use ARP HCY funds for these students that are also considered homeless. 
So it's not just all your immigrant or your refugee children. It's those uh, that meet that definition of homelessness and they can actually, you can actually use the funds for professional development, teacher recruitment, translation services, um, instructional materials for their recently arrived students and developing materials to uh, um, access children in their native languages. So it's really important that you also look throughout your LEA if you have um, students that are coming to you through a through as an immigrant or refugee or even asylum. So the next 40 minutes, we are gonna break it up, hopefully 10 in, about 10 minutes each. We're gonna hear from four different LEAs. I put a county on one end within two districts and a county on the other. You'll see that the county obviously looks different than our districts, but at the same time, you can see the correlation. So um, first and foremost, I would like to introduce, is it Margaret? Yes, M Margaret Lewis and Karen Thomas. They are from, one, one is from the, uh, Margaret is from, um, the El Dorado County Office of Education and Karen is from the El Dorado County Health and Human Services. And what I've tried to do is on each of their general, um, this general title page is kind of give you an, a breakdown of, of their LEA. So El Dorado County has 15 school districts, 67 schools, 31,000 total, enrollment, 923 countywide. And I believe that this is based on 21, 22, maybe 20, yeah, 21, 22. They received $39,000 in ARP1 funds, and they received a total of $108,000 in ARP2 funds countywide. So I'm gonna turn it over to Margaret and Karen. Thank you for being here and just let Denise, know when you're ready for an, a slide. Thank you, Leanne. And I want to ask in advance that you forgive my voice. And if I need to pause the cough, I'm on the downward side of one of those bugs that's going around. So forgive me. Um, thank you for allowing us to go first. Karen is actually with Health and Human Services, and she was part of one of the programs that we implemented using ARP funds. And so I asked her to be here so that she could talk about the experience they had on their side of being a partner in this uh, initiative that we did. So um, going first means that when I'm, we're done, she can pop off if she needs to. So thank you for that. Um, if you would go to the next slide, please. So we did a variety of things. These are kind of the larger ticket items, so to speak, that we did with our ARP funds. There were also smaller um, aspects as well. Probably, um, well, I'll just go in order. Big brothers, big sisters mentorship is often stymied in our area. We're very vast geographically. So think about um, in our county, we go from El Dorado Hills, bordering Sac County, all the way up to South Lake Tahoe. And then smaller areas out in our Georgetown, what's called the divide area going up toward Auburn and rural communities uh, in the other direction as well. So very geographically, uh, economically, socially, um, uh, diverse. And part of that means that Big Brothers Big Sisters, if you're familiar with them, has challenged getting people to mentor um, these students who are in such various different areas. So we wanted to focus on a way to get mentorship to our youth who are not only moving around quite a bit, but also in those more remote areas. Similarly, we wanted to have school social workers available to some of our schools that are at low capacity in terms of counselors or social workers. For instance, we have two of the last many um, one room schoolhouses in the state. And so how do we get social work outreach to them? And then the reason Karen is here is that we did something called the first night bag initiative, which is for people who are in their first night of being unsheltered through HHSA. For those of you who are familiar, there's something called the Temporary Housing Assistance Program where they get a certain number of nights in a hotel. We wanted to get word out to them about their educational um, rights at that very first outset of them having this experience. Finally, we looked at tutoring and then we did a significantly large um, countywide professional development 
bringing in the communicating across barriers with Dr. Donna Beagle, who does poverty education and um, communication across barriers. She says poverty is resolvable. However, making a difference for people who live in the crisis of poverty requires a paradigm shift, a shift that moves us beyond stereotypes and judgment to a deeper understanding of the causes of poverty and its impact on human beings. We wanted to really move that um, poverty awareness, ACEs awareness, kind of those things we've all been working on. How do we move those out of the initiative state and into resiliency, understanding, and really beginning some tools around um, implementing those shifts. And so we worked with her in that regard. Next slide, please. So the first two items, and I have my timer on here. Um, the first two items with both Big Brothers, Big Sisters and with our school site social worker was that we braided funds with our foster program. At our COE, we have a foster youth coordinator and then my, myself, the can make Kenny Bencho. So some of the programs were already in existence, like tutoring and that sort of thing, where we could just piggyback onto them for our McKinney Venture youth. But in both cases, we did not have mentorship or um, the capacity building through the licensed clinical social worker resource person. So we blended our funds and went and hired a part-time FTE at Big Brothers and Big Sisters. They hired somebody who specialized in working with people who were willing, so working with volunteers, who were willing to work with people who were in um, geographically diverse areas, and then also who were willing to be ACEs trained and work with folks who were um, in extenuating circumstances. Again, we blended funds to have a, a quarter time FTE of a licensed clinical social worker who went out to four of our district, different districts identified as having a capacity need and serving those students um, as well. Next slide, please. Most exciting to me because it was kind of out of the box of what we had done previously and because it allowed me to connect with my former workplace. So I come from the HHSA world and having colleagues in that world kind of had some ideas about ways we could do outreach, particularly looking at zero to five population, because while we work closely with our Head Start and Early Head Start and state preschool programs, we can't identify children who aren't enrolled in those, right? We can enroll those who come, but we needed to do a larger scale outreach. And so um, what we did, and we I'm trying to think about the best angle to take it, but basically we, we braided funds. We got a um, grant from a local nonprofit and we took those dollars and purchased items. So we used um, EHCY funds, ARP funds, and then local grant. We combined those to buy products for infants through adults made backpacks that we called first night backpacks. And they had family size hygiene products that were appropriate for the age group, whether that was feminine hygiene products, deodorants, toothbrushes, toothpaste, all of those types of things. And then we put educational packets in them with programs relating to the age that each backpack was created for. And then we handed those over to HHSA um, to distribute to people who were receiving their temporary housing assistance. So if you aren't familiar with temporary housing assistance, and I didn't really like Karen up to talk about this, and I don't know that we want to spend a lot of time on it, but just um, briefly what happens is if you are literally unsheltered and you, and you are on CalWORKs and you go to HHSA and say, I am unsheltered, you provide the verification that they need, you are then allocated 16 nights uh, in a couple of night increments at a time. So you're going to a hotel sometimes with nothing, sometimes with what you have with you when you, you can carry it, depending on the situation. We wanted to make that transition easier for people. So we included some comfort items. And then also we wanted people to know that their educational rights started immediately when they were unsheltered. And so we asked them um, to please contact us and gave them all of the information. Next slide, please. So they were labeled with age brackets, zero to two, three to five, elementary, junior, high school, and then adult, so that we could track metrics without sharing personally identifiable information. So we knew that if we gave them 10 zero to two backpacks, then we could count outreach to 10 zero to two, because we know that any child in this family was experiencing homelessness. That's the only way they can get the temporary assistance. Um, we would send them, so Karen would call me and say, hey, we're out of three to five-year-old backpacks and we would deliver them the next day or within a few days. 
of one of the things we discovered is that we want to be able to track these more specifically. So in um, our next round of this, we will do that by adding um, numbers to each backpack and asking them if they would be willing to verify via that number that they did outreach to us so we can see the exact outcomes. But we can um, and did find that our numbers of people reaching out to us were significantly enhanced when this program was happening. Next slide, please. So I asked Karen to come and share just kind of what that looked like from their perspective and how that worked for the families that we were serving together. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Thomas. I'm a program manager for Colorado County Health and Human Services. And as Margaret said, one of the programs that we administer is CalWORKS. And so we are often seeing families um, on their first nights of homelessness. Many times children don't have anything. And I want to address the first question, how is the program for your staff? Um, so oftentimes it's not only challenging for clients, but also for our staff to um, continually, you know, assist people who are in crisis. And staff absolutely loved the program. They loved the backpacks and just the joy that the children showed when we were able to give them to them. It also was particularly impactful because some of the um, criteria that we go into during an eligibility interview is quite personal and can sometimes relate to domestic violence um, and other, other areas that parents really don't want to talk about in front of their children. And so the backpacks, they always included a coloring book or, you know, something special for the children. And we found that the children would usually go off and start coloring and really not be involved in that really personal interview, which the staff found really, really nice. They like that. Um, the families are very excited about the, the backpacks. They weren't expecting it. When they walk into our office, uh, they're expecting to be eligible for cash benefits and uh, food benefits, but to have something really special uh, that was theirs, the children were very surprised and very happy and the parents were too. So it was, they were very thankful. Uh, we also found that they were especially appreciative when teenagers were involved because often teenagers are overlooked um, as needing essentials. And these backpacks really carried a lot of important things such as deodorant and personal hygiene products uh, that teenagers use. And so it was very nice to have them personalized by age for the children. Um, the children are really appreciative as well of having something that was theirs. When they arrive in our office, they usually have very little possessions, if any at all. And so they were very excited to have something to carry their things in and something that was really theirs. It was really a positive experience for the people who came into our office who were in crisis. And so we really appreciate our collaboration with Margaret Lewis, and we're looking forward to her next round of backpacks. And for the last question, um, have, uh, Edco has seen a marked increase in the number of families being directly referred to the COE for assistance. Um, so yes, our staff have become more aware of McKinney Vento through this collaboration. Uh, the materials that are in the backpacks were oftentimes uh, going over them with the clients. And so we've become very familiar with what we're referring the clients to. And Margaret was very kind and came by and did a presentation on McKinney Vento for our supervisors to share with their staff. And so we feel, um, we feel better equipped to refer clients to Margaret uh, for assistance and anything extra that we can give our clients, we are appreciative of. Thank you, Karen. I really appreciate your being here, and um, I'm sure you're welcome to stay if you'd like, but I think that wraps up our presentation. Um, yeah, it's just been a wonderful experience. I saw somebody ask in the chat. I'm happy to send out a list of what was included in those backpacks. Yeah, so um, Karen and Margaret, there were a couple of um, questions. One was that we'd love to see a picture of the backpack, and maybe we can get we can get um, the heat tax to um, put that on their website. Um, I know you talked about 
Um, I do want to clarify that homeless children, we um, children and youth, they're identified by um, their nighttime residency. We call them homeless children and youth. We call them children and youth experiencing homelessness. We call them McKinney Vento students. We call them um, children and youth in transition. There's all kinds of um, terminology that we talk about with homeless children and youth. When you um, put the backpacks together, obviously, you know, you had, um, like you said, hygiene kits, um, feminine products, probably deodorant, um, all those different things. Did you go out and purchase those um, using ARP funding? Um, did you get donations? Was it a combination of both, all three? It was a combination of all three. So we had um, a young Eagle Scout who was doing his Eagle Scout program and he put together an Amazon list and had people drop ship items to us. Uh, we got a grant locally so that we could serve the adults in the families as well. And then we used ARP funds for the school supplies, the printing of the materials that went into the backpack related to educational programs. And then there were some comfort items, as Karen alluded to, um, some blanket for each person, water bottles, things that if you think about spending the night at a hotel and you're a young child, what would you need or want? Um, small activities, those kinds of things. So yes, there were all of the above, donations, private grants, tangible goods donated, and then ARP funds as well. Great. Denise, did you happen to see any more um, questions and answers specific to Karen and Margaret, Margaret's presentation? Um, I don't think specific to this presentation, but just a lot of specific um, expenditure questions, which I know we have guidance on we can provide at the end. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. So thank you, Karen and Margaret. I really, really appreciate you being here and, and doing the wonderful work that you're doing for our homeless children and youth in El Dorado County. Thank you so much. All right, our next presenters are from Hacienda La Puente Unified School District. They have 38 schools in their district, a total of 17,000 total enrollment with about 650 homeless children and youth. And they're an LEA that only receives ARP2 funds based on the, um, the formula. And they, received, they have received $166,000 in that funding and we have Marissa and Martha and I'm gonna let them introduce themselves further. And you are now in charge of, of, of your presentation. Thank you for being here. Thank you, um, Leanne. Thank you everyone for being here throughout California. We're noticing that there is Office of Education and school sites. And so we're very happy that all of you are here. My name is Martha Calderon. I'm the Director of Equity and Access Family Engagement. And I have my stellar um, McKinney-Vento counselor, Maritza Cabezas. Um, I'm the McKinney-Vento counselor here with Hacienda La Puente Unified School District. And this school year, we already have, we've had an increase of McKinney-Vento students identified. We have now about 850. So we have seen an increase. Um, and I think also because of the, the pre-recruitment uh, that we do over the summer that Maritza will talk about, our Operation Student Success Program um, that we've been able to identify and help with even filling out that they have the form and reaching out to families. So we have seen an increase. So we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, so I saw a lot of you were asking about gift cards and gas cards in the chat. So yes, under the allowable expenditures, we are able to buy gift cards and gas cards. However, we know that every district is different and you do have to kind of advocate with the right people. So I've been doing advocacy since last year, actually since ARP came in and I, I said, hey, this is a list of allowable expenses. I talked to my boss, then I went to talk to the person over fiscal, then I went to talk to the assistant superintendent over business. And so it's that communication that really allowed us to actually move forward with this program. So we were able to, uh, purchase gift cards. But one thing I do want to say is we utilize uh, a special vendor called Hawk Marketplace, which we could give later to Leanne. And we purchased the gift cards um, through this website. And we first started like, let's just do $5,000. Let's see how it works because it's money. 
and we had it's high accountability. And so um, we did our first purchase with five thousand dollars, and we actually have to pay them prior to them sending us the gift cards because they need the money. It's money exchanging money. And so although it took a little bit of time, if you want to do something like this, you have to start now. Just like Leanne said, you have to have to spend, spend, spend. So please, if you want to do this, you have to start now, start talking to your key players, show that uh, dear colleague letter, because I'm thinking I need to use that to expedite some of the expenditures that we're currently doing. Um, and so we were able to purchase uh, food gift cards for grocery gift cards, Kroger, and we ensured that we came up with a good policy practices on how to do this because our district is like, how are you going to be doing this? You have to have high accountability. So yeah, um, our McKinney Vento counselor was able to develop with other heat tech um, uh, policies and procedures have been developed. We utilize some of their tools and came up with a system. And so now we have a procedures in place. You do have to buy a, a safe. So if you don't have a safe, that's another way you could spend your ARP money so that you put your gift cards in there. And so we purchase a safe, we have procedures in place, we have the documents that you need um, to do it, but we do it based on need. So for example, if we have a family that is just started, you know, we identify as being unhoused, you know, Maritza does a full intake. Um, she reviews the policies and guidelines and we're able to give them the gift card for food. Now, so we have grocery cards, but we also have like uh, McDonald's and other like quick things, even though it's not the best and healthy um, stuff. Sometimes they just need something in their bellies. And if they don't have the, the shelter yet, at least they could go into a restaurant, eat, and then they go to, you know, to their referral for the, for their intakes. So for a shelter. So that's just an, an example. Or we have also gift cards for clothing. So we have Old Navy and TJ Maxx. We find that these are also for immediate need where we have families that don't have anything. And so we're able to give them a gift card right away. Or we have those families where we have uniforms, but this student is a little taller and a little bigger and we don't have their size. And so now they could utilize the gift card to purchase something that they need um, in their size. And also the high school kids don't use uniforms. So it's another way that you could use your gift card for those kids at the high school and uh, middle school level if they're not using uniforms. Um, and then on, on top of that, we develop a gas card program. So we found that um, our families that need some help with you know, they're going through a lot of transition. Um, we had an example of a family that was in a domestic violence situation, who lived like 22 miles away from us, but wanted to continue in our district when we wanted that continuity. Her children have been in our district for like, I don't know, is it like, since kinder. like since kinder. And so we put her in the program. We've had great success. Um, she attendance went up. She would come and volunteer at our, our local uh, agency that we work with. And so now she actually has permanent housing, but that's just one example. So the ga gas card program does work. Um, in addition to that, we use hop, skip and drive. I'm not sure if you know about the transportation. It's like a like an Uber, but it's so, so expensive um, for, for us to do that. But when we have to, we will. But so gas cards are something that ha we have found that has been very uh, successful. Um, next, slide. next slide, please. I do want to share that we do have the families um, sign an agreement that they could only purchase certain, you know, whatever we're saying that they need, um, that they have to have a receipt after purchase. Um, in the gift cards for like the Kroger groceries, we make sure we put a label that they cannot purchase alcohol or tobacco products. So we put that on there. Um, and we also let them know that this is for school attendance. So we, we need to see that the children are being brought to school. Um, and if they're finding any issues to please let us know because part of the program is we need to see success in their attendance. Next slide, please. The other thing we did is this started off as a grant that we got from one of our local supervisors and also Clorox. And so we got the LA laundry truck. Uh, it started off uh, as a, a grant funded program. And then later on ARP was able to bring in you know, additional funding to continue it throughout the year. But basically is we have a truck that does laundry services for our families. It comes in, um, we don't have the laundry truck at a school site because we don't want our families to know that they're bringing their, their laundry and they say, hey, there's your mom or, you know, why is your mom here with laundry? 
So we have it in our adult school. One day a week, families bring their laundry and just drop it off. They have to, obviously there's um, policies also in place. And then they come at the end of the day and the laundry is already cleaned. Um, it's washed, it's dried and folded and the families just come in to break, you know, pick it up. And we usually have, it's a time between eight and 3, 30, 4 o'clock. So they could drop it off after they drop off the kids from school. And then at the end of the day, they could pick up their clothes and they'll have clothes for the rest of the week until the laundry um, truck comes again. It's a very expensive program too. And so we're, you know, we're trying to figure out how we are able to sustain it. Um, but we do have uh, the Board of Education um, behind this program. So we're hoping that we're able to sustain it even after ARP funding is gone. Um, so we do about 20 to 40 loads maximum that day that they do come. There's a lot of considerations you need to have. that, And we learned about this. It wasn't an easy thing, you guys. You have to really plan it out, work your facilities manager, you know, where are you gonna have this location? Is there enough electricity to go through for the laundry truck to plug in? Um, the truck dimensions, um, water access, gray water disposal. So I learned more about this than I never, that I ever wanted to. So just know that this is one, another way that you could spend your money. Now, if you don't have this service around your area, the other thing we do with our local partners is we purchase laundry gift cards. The, the, the community partners do that. We don't do that. We're trying to figure out how we could purchase that. But we have found that the laundry cards for families works exceptionally. And then we're able to get um, laundry detergent and other items they need to do laundry. So that's another avenue if you don't have this opportunity at your in your in your local area. And I'll go on to the next slide, please. And those, so these are the considerations. What we've done is we have our McKinney Vento list. Um, and low income families list and we call them and let them know about the service. So we do phone banking, we do an intake. So it does take some time, but we have identified staff that does that so that we are utilizing the truck because you don't want the truck just to sit there. We want to make sure families are getting getting um, the service because it, like I said, ARP, money, uh, ARP funding is paying for this, but we do want to sustain it. So that's the LA truck. Um, laundry truck that we have. And I know that they're going to other school districts. Uh, we were one of the first ones. And um, I think now that they're they're at LAUSD. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Okay, so it, I'm Maritza Cabezas and I'm the counselor right here at Hacienda La Puente Unified School District. Um, so every year we wanna make sure that our students are ready for the beginning of the year, right? Um, usually in the past years, we would do just like a backpack distribution with uh, uniforms and shoes. But this year we decided to do something a little bigger. Um, we collaborated with the uh, Willow Adult School here in Hacienda La Puente. And so we uh, basically, we made this huge event where students um, were invited to participate. So we had about 600 McKinney Vento students participating, including um, preschool students were invited as well. And in this event, students were able to receive a backpack, school supplies, uniforms, shoes. In addition to that, um, our Willow Adult School provided haircuts for our students, and they also provided uh, dental screenings through their school. Um, we also invited agencies to provide information for our students. So we had a resource room. We had um, community colleges, we had the library, we had agencies that not only provided information, but they also provided referrals for WIC, for Medi-Cal, uh, the employment. We had American Jobs uh, Centers of California also participated in this huge event. Um, all the items were purchased through ARP. So all the shoes, all the backpacks, all the school supplies, all the uniforms, uh, were uh, provided through ARP money. Uh, we even uh, purchase um, items for our preschools for the little ones. Um, and so we had um, 60 McKinney Vento families from the early education program participate and receive all their items. Um, we actually also provided hygiene kits for our families that were donated through uh, baby to baby. Um, and we had the Colgate van come and provide information um, toothpaste and toothbrushes for our students. Um, 
And it just turned out, um, it was some very excellent data. As you can see, the smiles on the children's faces. One thing we did um, do is we wanted to provide uh, backpacks that would last. So we actually uh, purchased um, very sturdy backpacks this year. <laughs> Um, the shoes were also, you know, we we wanted um, shoes that, you know, kids would feel comfortable wearing to school. So they received like Nikes, Adidas shoes um, through Shoes That Fit. That's the agency that we purchased all the shoes from. Um, next slide, please. And we also understand the importance of collaborating with not only our staff, but also the collaboration with all the leaders and staff from the whole district. So we know that we can use some of ARP funding um, in conferences. So in order to, you know, um, expand the awareness of our program and the need for our Mankini Vento families, uh, we invited our board member, superintendent, and other uh, district administrators to participate in the NACI conference. Um, we also took administrators from our um, uh, adult school. We also um, invited uh, people from our um, early education program. And we invited counselors, we invited um, classified, we invited, invited uh, certificated personnel. We took a huge group uh, last year to NACI and we're doing it again this year. Um, we know that it's important to get the support from our district leaders and the more aware and informed they are about our program, the more successful um, our program is going to be uh, because we truly do need their support. And we also did the same thing for the CASQA. Uh, we invited counselors, we invited school administrators, um, and um, because we know the importance of decreasing chronic absenteeism. So we wanna make sure that they understand and they're aware of new laws and new strategies on how to do that. Um, this year, we're gonna be doing the same thing. We're gonna be inviting a big group of people um, to those conferences. Um, and we see, we're seeing great success with that because we see a lot more support and we see a lot more collaboration from different uh, departments within our district. And so now, I don't know if anybody has any questions regarding any of the slides that we presented. I know there was a lot of things going on and it's so wonderful to see um, people answering questions on your behalf or giving them their, giving others input. And that is exactly what's, what's happening. And I know that we are having lots of questions about um, the um, gift cards and the allowable expenses, and we will get to that. I want to add to this one before I um, I introduce our next person. California is doing their second um, statewide conference, uh, which ARP funds can be used for that as well. And um, after our field colleagues um, speak, I will show you a link of where you can learn more about the 2024 Homeless Education um, Statewide Conference. Um, Marissa and Martha, thank you so very much. I think that there's an important piece that I put your email um, at each slide at the top of at the very first slide so that people can, if they didn't get their, they don't get their answers to their questions today, that they can reach out to you directly. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you're doing. And I re we really appreciate you being here. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful things. Thank you. So next slide is another, is going to be another um, local educational agency right outside of Sacramento here. I have Hannah Anderson and she is from Rockland Unified School District. They have 21 schools about 13,000 in total enrollment with only about 163 homeless children and youth. And they receive about $28,000 in ARP too. So Hannah, thank you so much for being here and being willing to present. And I'm gonna turn it over to you to um, let Denise know when you're ready for your next slide. Okay. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. My name is Hannah Anderson. I'm a, the Director of Innovation School Programs and Accountability for the Rockland Unified School District. 
I, um, my colleagues laugh, they call me the director of potpourri because I do a lot of different things in the district, but I think the thing that um, I'm most passionate about um, is supporting our uh, foster youth and our youth living in homelessness within the district. And um, it keeps me grounded and connected and able to partner with all um, different people in our community. So I'm excited to be here today and share um, about how we used um, our ARP HCY funds, um, but also because we, um, as an LEA, didn't receive very many of these funds, how we work creatively with local um, partnerships and all different types of funding to um, ensure that our students living in homelessness um, have many different um, types of services and supports um, to gain access to our schools. So I'm ready for that next slide. Um, when I train um, our school staff throughout the district, I share, and our, our school secretaries who serve as our clerical liaisons, um, I share this uh, I share this quote, and I do this because I want all of our um, school staff to know that we hold all of our students um, across the state and, and in our district, we hold all of our students to a high expectation, and we want um, all of our students to achieve at high levels, but we also um, are cognizant and recognize that um, the path to getting to those outcomes may be different for each individual student, and we need to make sure that we um, have a deep understanding of who the students are that are um, in we're serving in our school communities and how we can support them. Um, so you can go to the next slide, please. So um, services that we offer and that I train um, all of our staff um, on are that we um, ensure that students um, who need access to transportation have that access to transportation. And then um, obviously now, um, across the state, students receive free breakfast and lunch, but we also um, make sure that students who um, may also need snacks in between and other um, uh, food services can receive those. Um, we are able to provide um, uh, we are able to provide funding for uh, co-curricular field trips and actually through donations, we also are able to provide funding through extracurricular um, field trips as well. We have a technology loan program, so any student um, in 7 through 12 um, receives a Chromebook uh, automatically here in our school district as part of their programming to access online text, but any of our TK through 6th grade families who need a uh, Chromebook for their students to use outside of the um, classroom can do that, and we have a process where we've um, where we have Chromebooks for checkout that are available for a year long loan. Um, we also are partnering this year with T-Mobile to provide a different type of hotspot for families that actually has um, all of the social services um, in our surrounding area. I was able to select what families would have access to. Um, so I can actually preload um, school information and all of our local partnerships right there on those devices for them. And then there's a hotspot button as well for them to be able to access community resources. I'll share more about the school supplies and backpacks, but those are certainly available to all of our students. We also um, have a tutoring program where um, any of our students with an academic need um, who are living in homelessness can gain access to one-on-one -on -one tutoring through our classified or certificated staff on our campuses. Um, we've had a long-standing um, gift card program in the district where we um, can utilize uh, gift cards purchased through these funds um, and also have utilized Title I funds um, to purchase school-related items um, and have a process that was set up for that. So that's been a, um, a relatively turnkey um, option in, in our district. And certainly I'm happy to, to share those documents with folks who are just getting started in this arena. Um, and then we have um, referrals um, to shoe and um, clothing options for families. So we, we've we definitely hand um, the gift cards with a letter very similar to the last presenters. Um, we also though uh, know that uh, gift cards for clothing don't always go as far as we might want them to go for, get, for getting um, school uh, clothing. And so we also have many community partners who are coming alongside us and, and offering um, 
free shopping opportunities to our students. And it's just about being out in the community and asking. And there's so many families and, and um, community agencies who want to help. And um, the last two pieces on here is just our summer school um, we are able to offer. Um, and that's based on academic need. And then through the expanded learning program, now able to offer free after school care for two and a half hours to all of our TK through sixth grade students um, living in homelessness. Um, next slide, please. So in addition to all those direct services, these are the free um, services that we're able to offer that we um, provide to all of our um, homeless families. Um, we have a homeless uh, and foster youth task force that we've put um, in place in the district. And now it's really an advisory committee after the, um, the implementation of the ideas went through. But part of this was ensuring that our teachers and school staff um, can receive confidential information so that they know how to um, which students need that extra handle with care in their classrooms. All of our interventions in our um, schools, we uh, um, ensure priority placement for students living in homelessness into these. It seems like these seem like easy ideas, but sometimes the communication of this um, at the school site level, just ensuring that our school counselors who are placing students into classrooms um, and our school principals at the elementary level know who these students are to ensure that they are gaining access to these intervention programs if they need it. They also have priority access to our mental health services in the district. Um, they can gain access to um, kind of wraparound type services, um, referrals to outside agencies, and then that we are available to do home visits um, uh, or support with direct outreach or meet, meet families where they are. Um, I guess I should also mention that um, the majority of our families living in homelessness in, um, in our surrounding area, the majority of them are in doubled up situations um, and or, you know, we've got um, roughly 10 families living in uh, hotels and motels. And so for me, not being in a district with over 600 um, families experiencing homelessness, I'm able to actually do a lot of this one-on-one -on -one, um, support um, faster and with less barriers, I guess I could say. Okay, next slide, please. So this is, I think, the piece where um, our county a, um, office said, go and share this, because this has been um, very similar to the last presenter, just some this amazing opportunity that we've been able to provide um, to not just our families living in homelessness, but actually our foster youth families, our highest needs socioeconomic disadvantaged families, and um, our multilingual learners um, in the district. So we do advertising to all of these families to come to a back to school fair that's a one back to school fair for the whole district that's separate from the back to school activities happening at each individual campus. And our purpose with this fair is to create an opportunity for Rockland families um, to feel welcome in our district and ensure that they have everything that they need to start the year. So all of my colleagues, my administrator colleagues, and many um, who sit on this advisory panel um, truly believe that we want to ensure that students can go to school and um, have very few outward facing characteristics that look anything like any other student walking into a Rockland campus. And so our goal is that we can um, provide this back to school fair to make those back to school times um, less stressful and ensure that children have everything that they need and families um, are taken care of along the way. So in the fair, the families come in, they check in and they get a folder um, and walk through a whole bunch of Rockland Unified information. So things that are just gonna be at their fingertips. When does school start? Who can I contact at my school? Who's the site-based liaison at my school who can help me? Um, we have a transportation table set up there with Chromebooks where they can do their sign up and everything right there for transportation. We have nutrition services there where they can ask any questions related to uh, nutrition. We have a technology services table where they can ask anything related to our tech program. We also have signups for um, tutoring that are happening right there. So it's this captive audience of ensuring that all of our families can know these are the services and also you can sign up right here. Um, because we do invite our um, English learner families, um, we ensure that we have all of our in-district translators and our English learner staff there. We also have been able to um, 
we've been able to utilize our reclassified um, English learner students to serve as translators and they receive community service hours um, for high school for doing this and they um, it's so wonderful to see them welcoming families into the district and sharing about their experiences um, and walking families through this fair. Um, the thing that makes that is heartening to me, um, I think it's wonderful when we can give school supplies away. I also know that when I am getting ready for my own children to go to school, they can go to a store and they can shop and they can pick out the things that they want to pick out. And if they want a blue folder, they can get a blue folder and those kinds of things. And so we've um, tried to ensure that um, children have choices. And so we set up a whole table, we share with them of what you need at different grade levels, and then they get to pick. I want that folder, I want that um, uh, pencil box, um, I would like that water bottle, and it really gives them the opportunity to fill their a backpack of their choosing with items of their choosing that they need for school. We have amazing community partners who've donated hygiene supplies, um, amazing community partners who help us with um, door prizes, um, Again, signups for all kinds of things. Oh, I put tutoring on there twice. It is very important. <laughs> and um, we also have local partners there. So um, our county office of education is there to talk about our preschool programs in the area. Um, our local community college is there to share about um, their programs. So it's just been the more the merrier and people are welcome to come and share. We also um, have a pretty extensive data confirmation process at the start of the year that can be a huge barrier for families when thinking about starting the year, especially if there's parts in there where they have to print something and sign something and bring something. So we, um, we have all of that there for them to get translated help filling out this information or just time. We set up um, child care spaces where there's arts and crafts going on for kids so parents can sit down and actually get all their paperwork filled out. It's just a really awesome event. Um, year three next year, we're shooting to do some similar things uh, uh, as we have been doing, but we want to add in um, back to school haircuts, um, additional community partnerships with some of our medical and dental um, uh, partners in the community. And then we also have a goal that um, we all have school picture companies there handing out vouchers for school pictures so that every child has the opportunity to see themselves and have um, have a picture package alongside their peers. So, um, okay, next slide and last slide. Um, so I will just say you saw we only received, you know, less than $30,000 of these funds. So I'm sure you can do a lot if you received more, but um, we are very creative, follow every single letter of the law when spending our funding, but we have to do a lot of braiding of funding and a lot of local donations um, to be able to accomplish um, uh, all of the things that I talked about on the previous slide. So use your Title I dollars, use your Title Three dollars, you have supplemental and concentration funds through LCFF. Um, use local donations. Um, it's mo mostly local churches that help us with many of setting up, like they take ownership over the hygiene table and this is their table and they're gonna sponsor it every year and that's what they're doing. We have another group who does all the water bottles. So just really giving people and kind of their niche and their area where they can come focus, they can take pride, they can take pictures back to their community. So it's just been an awesome opportunity for, um, for our whole community to come together and, and support and really believe that it takes a village. So thank you again for having me. And that's the end of my portion. Thank you so very much. I, I totally appreciate Hannah, you being here, being willing to present on behalf of Rockland. I think that this slide is one of the most important ones and it deals with that sustainability of grading funds. Um, you know, come September, October 1, 2024, we're all going to be falling off the cliff um, in regards to all of the funding that we've been receiving. And um, so the more you can braid now, the better off you can. Thank you so very much. And please reach out to Hannah if you have further questions about her program. We are um, looking at a very short timeline with about um, yeah 18 minutes and we have one more field colleague. Um, plus, I want to wrap things up. So Kathy Nye is from Ventura County Office of Education, 
She has 28 school districts, 302, approximately 302 schools. They have 132,000 countywide total enrollment with about 58, probably 5,900 homeless enro enrollment. Um, Ventura County Office receives ARP1 funds, so they also receive the EHCY funds, and that was roughly about $400,000. And then she, they also receive countywide $987,000 in ARP2 fund. So Kathy, thank you for being here. Kathy has about two slides to go through what she's been doing countywide. And I really appreciate you being here, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Leanne, and everybody else who was prior to me. I will repeat a few things, but, and I know we're close on time, so I will go very quickly. Um, first thing I want to do is explain a little bit about our county to you. Um, I think somebody earlier on said they had one of the one-room schoolhouses. Well, Ventura County has the other one. Um, we have one school district, uh, one-room schoolhouse that has about 50 students in it, and then we have a big urban um, district that has 22,000 students. So we have a huge, huge spread in the different kinds of schools um, that we have in Ventura County. Our county is very large. We border Los Angeles County, Kern County, and Santa Barbara County. Um, we have East County, which is our Simi Valley and Conejo, which all borders Los Angeles. And then we have our West County that um, goes up to Ojai in the mountains and um, down to the beach of Oxnard. Um, huge agriculture. Most of the strawberries in the United States get grown here in, in uh, Ventura County. So lots and lots of agriculture, which means we have lots and lots of um, agricultural workers in our community. Um, like somebody else said, a huge amount of our students um, are in doubled up situations. It runs between 85 to 91 percent on an annual basis. And just so you know, she shared uh, that 5,839, which was a, num a few years ago, we actually um, went out at 8,180 students of this latest CalPads cumulative score uh, or cumulative number. So our numbers have gone up substantially. Um, next slide, please. So, um, I said it right there that we uh, actually in this last school year, we had 8,180 students. So um, at the County Office of Ed, um, the ARP1 funds, I from the get go said, my districts know what their students need better than I do at the County Office. So I did um, MOUs with every single district based on a formula that I got from CDE on, um, how much money they would get. So they not only got ARP2 funds, they also got these ARP1 funds from me. And over the last couple of weeks, um, Leanne shared with me what ARP2 funds hadn't been spent. And so I've been working with each one of those districts to say, okay, you, and a lot of our liaisons did not even know they had those ARP2 funds. It kind of went to the financial people and my um, liaisons didn't know. So, and, and in other cases, the liaison knew, but the financial people didn't know. So we opened up a lot of communication between um, uh, the sides of the houses in each one of our districts and are identifying how they can use that. And the one thing I told them is don't buy hygiene kits, don't buy backpacks, don't buy school supplies. I will have that for you at the county office. I uh, partner with United Way Back to School campaign. We give away between 2,000 and 3,000 stuffed backpacks and hygiene kits every single year before the school year starts. And then we also do a, a middle of the school year um, basis. I have a great relationship with supply.org out of Oakland. They just sent me another uh, email today about um, how much more stuff they've gotten in and how much more do I want. I could double the capacity of the little storage shed I have um, and taking things in from them. Um, next slide, please. So just in going through some of the funds that our districts have used, um, Transportation fees. We do have Hop Skip Drive and ALC, which used to be, uh, which now is Ever Driven, um, 
for in our community. So we our districts are able to use those, you know, um, Uber services to school Uber services for transportation. We also have gas cards within our community. I the county office doesn't buy cards at any of kind, but our school districts can buy those. So we've looked at gift cards, Walmart, Vons, Target. Um, we've done emergency motel nights. Our districts have spent money on that. They've spent money on hotspot fees, lost Chromebook fees. You know, a homeless family sometimes moving from one place to another. You know, we've had to deal with that. Um, we also hired a part-time outreach specialist that's working with our seniors that are in homelessness in our county. Um, I just did a, 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 an a analysis for um, one of our TAY um, providers that uh, we had over 600 students identified as McKinney Vento that were home um, last year. So this person actually goes out, works with the local um, counselors to be sure that they're um, filling out their FAFSAs, looking at the different um, opportunities. Additionally, um, for those districts that can't do uh, gift cards, we've done um, shopping trips, online uh, picking out what they wanted from Target and then ordering that stuff and having it direct shipped directly to the school from them. We've also supported in professional development by taking our LEAs to the California State Conference, um, to um, LACO puts on a great conference every year. We're taking several people down there this year. Um, one of our school districts is now doing, they call it backpack meals on Friday afternoon. So our kids have nutrition over the weekends. Um, and we have some great community-based organizations that some of our districts have contracted with so that the families can go back repeatedly to them for clothing. Um, and then the one creative thing that we're working on this year hasn't come to fruition, but we wanna do a creative arts enrichment days where we'll invite 160 students to go um, of the early er ages, kindergarten, first and second, go through a creative arts enrichment day where they'll be exposed to um, music, um, poetry writing and, um, and uh, painting um, by local, um, uh, local artists in our area of those uh, three disciplines. So quickly, I know <laughs> Leanne's only got five more minutes, so I'm going to turn it over to her. Um, but um, thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Kathy. I really, really appreciate it. Didn't mean to rush you through this. Um, we are all so very excited about all the work that all of you are doing. And um, my next slide is all about thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I not only thank the, the presenters today and the HEAT Tech and our, my CD staff, and, and I also just want to thank you for being here. It's been a really um, important piece. And I have just, even though the, the PowerPoint goes until slide number 59, I'm going to have um, Denise go through the next couple slides because these are some of my ideas that I think are really important for you to think about um, when talking, when thinking about spending your funding, um, professional development, translation of various forms, creating a hotline media plan for outreach, especially with November coming up, which is our national um, homeless awareness month. Hiring staff to work on identification, attendance, data collection, um, maybe even working with your zero to five population or your career to college, um, case management, social workers. So you have a year. You can even increase somebody if they're working part time that you increase them um, to full time to um, to work on, you know, all the the different barriers or the different things that you need. Next slide. Um, increase your liaisons time, clerical staff or data specialist. Um, to make sure that they're focusing on homeless um, pieces, providing more transportation services, enrichment activities and tutoring programs, um, preschool services, referrals, parent programs, even a mentoring program for your high school seniors, thinking about doing um, trips to the local um, community colleges um, or even you know, UCs or state. Um, the next slide, collaborate, 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 working with any and all agencies. And sometimes if you do a, a, a contract with one of these 
community-based organizations, they can go purchase your, your prepaid gift cards or your gas cards. They can open a PO for um, a laundry service where families just go in and give them their name and they can do their laundry. So think outside the box, be kind of creative. Yes, sometimes a contract takes a long time. Some LEAs take a very long time. Some LEAs, it takes forever. Um, using thinking about starting up a food pantry or closed closet if you get something started now you have that sustainability starting in 24 25 so purchasing school um, uniforms pe clothes socks shoes um, even jackets hygiene kits toiletries those things next slide make a plan work with your liaison work with your fiscal people work for with your big wigs and try to come up with a plan. Remember your deadlines are not necessarily September 2024. A lot of your purchase orders or your purchase recs have to be done by March or April. So you really need to think about what you need and how you're gonna spend these funds. Um, so maybe break it down by month, create a plan and work with one another. Next slide. And like I said, I got to put the pitch in for um, Save the Day for May 8th through the 10th in San Diego. We're going back to the town and country in San Diego. And um, it is a two-day conference, which is on the 9th and the 10th. And we're hoping to expand. We had, I think, over 400 people last year. And I think we're, we're ready for about 600. And on the 8th, we will have um, a reception, kind of a networking. And I, I can't tell you, but I was so impressed with our, our conference committee and all the present presentations that we had at our 2023. And we're hoping that the 2024 is going to knock our socks off. And then go ahead and go to the next slide, Denise. So the next several slides are all about the allowable uses of ARP funds. And if you're familiar with the Education for Homeless Children and Youth grant funds, there are 16 authorized activities. And ARP went ahead and added about seven more. If you click on that resource guide right there, it will go through the 16 authorized activities, tutoring, transportation, professional development, um, all those things that are in the quarterly report for your ARP2, plus motel or hotel vouchers, um, what, um, as you heard, hotspots, technology, those kinds of things are right there and you want to supplement. So quickly go through those slides until we get to kind of the end, Denise, if you wouldn't mind. So there's three, there's four, there's four tutoring, transportation, early ed, expedited, keep going. We're doing good. Fees for tracking, um, that stop right there, Denise. That last bullet on that slide is a huge one. Other extraordinary or extraordinary or emergency assistance to attend school. So if I've had somebody say, well, can we pay a phone bill? Can we pay an electricity bill? That would fall there as long as it's kind of a one-time thing. All other resources have been exhausted. You've tried to get community agencies, faith-based organizations. You've tried to pay for it some other way. And this is the only way you can do it, then yes. That is your key. If you want to purchase big items, such as you know, something that's over $5,000, a vehicle, there is a capital outlay form that you have to fill out and has to be approved by me. And if you're thinking of doing that, then you need to reach out to me directly. So I'm gonna skip to almost the last slide. All the things about various gift cards, we've talked about it. The forms are up on the HETAX website. They have some great accountability pieces. Um, the United States Department of Education says it's a go. It's fine. Keep going. 
We have quarterly reports for ARP2. ARP1 does expenditure reports, which are different. This is your timeline for your ARP2 funds. Keep going. Obviously, guidance and resources, um, Alejandra and Denise and Dana have been wonderful in putting all of these links in the chat, but they're also on the website or on the um, PowerPoint. You can find almost everything that we've talked about on our website. Um, Schoolhouse Connection also has a great website, how to spend these funds. The last bullet, this is the most important. I am, I have been given the task of being the ARP to HCY2 fiscal and program person. So if you have questions about ARP2, send me an email directly. Because if you do send it to the homeless ed, which is great, they're just gonna forward it on to me, whoever is manning that. So send me an email if you have questions, if you need something, I am here to support you and to work with you if you need to set up meetings to talk about how we can spend your money. Um, I have provided your county offices kind of how you how you're doing as LEA spending your L ARP2 funding. So please reach out to me if you have any questions. After this presentation, I usually try to get my responses to emails within a day. It might take me a little bit longer because I'm, I have a feeling I'm gonna be flooded with ARP2 questions. Um, last slide. Questions, we really don't have time. I think I went through most of them and answered to all groups. Um, Mark, uh, Martha and uh, Marissa, if you're still here, they were talking about the Hawk Marketplace. That is um, Hacienda La Puente. So please um, reach out to them. And again, my hat goes off to each and every one of you as homeless liaisons, fiscal, people higher up than those. Um, I also want to, again, thank my HETAX, my CDE staff, and my biggest thank you to um, the, the presenters for today. Kathy, Margaret, Karen, Mar Martha, um, Hannah, and Marissa. Thank you so very much for all the wonderful work you're doing. And look, we made it. 3.30. No gift of time, but I hope this was enough information. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Leanne, for putting this together. I saw several of my LEAs attending, and I know this was good information for everybody.